So now, I'm, now I am going to tell everybody to shut up. No. <laughs> Good afternoon, and welcome to our latest Booklist Live event. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about a slight variation on our Reader's Advisory theme, Listener's Advisory. My name is Joyce Serex, and I'm the audiobooks editor at Booklist Magazine and a longtime audio reviewer and an addict, I'm afraid to say. Uh, this presentation is part of the RA Conversation series, which is generously funded by Novelist. And I encourage you to find out more about these events. Um, and I'm going to show you where. Ha. At our, on, our, uh, on Booklist Online, you can find out more about the events. You can see videos of past programs that we've done, and you'll be able to see announcements of forthcoming programs. We understand that Reader's Advisory Training is ongoing, and this is a way for us to provide continuing education. So check out those previous programs, join us for future ones, and, and keep, keep learning about Reader's Advisory. Before I go any further, though, I want to thank the Skokie Public Library for the, their hospitality and for allowing us to use this room here, which we hope will be loud enough in the Q&A without microphones. So we'll talk very loud then so it gets on tape for you. Um, we all know how popular audiobooks are in our libraries, but that doesn't mean that we're all comfortable with t suggesting titles from that collection, especially if we aren't listeners ourselves. And to help, we have a panel of RA librarians, who just happen to be audio fans here, um, who will offer ways to expand our knowledge of the world of audio. We'll, put, uh, we'll be mentioning favorite authors and narrators, and these are going to be available in a few days, uh, and so you don't need to worry about writing down everything that you hear. Don't write madly, because this information is going to be there for you. A link to the video is going to appear also on booklist.com booklistonline.com live events um, and that the video will also appear in our June audio, All Things Audio newsletter and if you're not aware of our All Things Audio newsletter and haven't subscribed, you can do that at the second uh, URL there. Then, <laughs> after, after our panel, since this is really all about the narrator, we have a narrator here. And Terry Schnaumelt from Waukegan is going to talk about what she does and read a passage from one of the books that she's narrated. After that, the, we're going to turn to the panel, each of whom is going to introduce herself by the kind of audiobooks that she enjoys. Um, Megan Schwark is going to talk, we'll talk about working with adults, Becky Bolin about working with young listeners, and Ren Renee Young will talk about novelists and how you can, libraries can use that to assist listeners as well. You may not know that Novelist also has audiobook reviews, and in fact, uh, you can find Booklist reviews on, on Novelist as well, Booklist audio reviews. And finally, there's going to be time for questions, and we'd ask that you hold your questions until the end and uh, ask them all together. All right, introducing myself as a listener. I read primarily for story, and so I listen primarily for story as well, and I have stories in my ears all day long. I listen across genres. I've got favorites in every single genre, and, and nonfiction too. In fact, I would say for me, it's much easier to read nonfiction on audio uh, than it was ever was for me to, to read the books. I read far more nonfiction than I ever did in, in my previous life. I find it much more pleasant on audio than in print. And I'm going to be mentioning a number of my favorites this afternoon, so I'm not going to burden them with you now. I will burden you with them now. We're really curious about our audience, though. Those of you who are here, and I have to get one of, I'll get one of my props later. Uh, how many of you are audiobook listeners? Okay. And how many of you consider yourself regular listeners? Like, you know, three to four a month. Okay, a few of us there. And how many of you have an audiobook with you today here in the room? Yeah, I'm going to get, I, I was going to get out my phone, but it takes too much time. And hold up my phone because, yes, I too have. Because, you know, what, what if something happened? You had an accident on the way home, or, or you, you were in a traffic jam. You've got to have something to listen to. Anyway, um, I'm going to set things up this afternoon by talking about how listeners choose titles. I realize I'm a slide behind already. Uh, that's me. <laughs> how listeners choose audiobooks. And I think the first way that listeners choose audiobooks is that we choose hot titles. You know, like readers, we want to read everything that's on the best list. And frankly, audiobooks are just as good a way for listeners to do that as books themselves are for readers. Um, the bestsellers, fiction and nonfiction, almost all of them, I would say close to 100%, you're going to find on audio. And if you buy them, 
and if you maybe shelve them with the books too, as Terry was suggesting at lunch, you're going to have readers who come to find the book, and the book is checked out, and take the audio again, and you've converted someone to audiobooks. Easy as that. <laughs> Um, in these examples that I've got up on the board, I think psychological suspense, um, the girl, the woman in the window, is particularly good on audio because it's that haunting atmosphere that really, you know, it's very tonal, I think. And that nothing beats having a, the writer of a memoir read his own book. And that's certainly true with Comey, who may not be a professional reader, but, but it's his book and you feel the power of his story and when he reads it. Um, the bestseller lists, though, aren't only the hottest books. We all know that when that blockbuster movie comes out, or that television series comes out, that, that we have to have the books. And luckily for us, they're often on audiobooks as well. And Ready Player One by Ernest Cline is a wonderful example of, of how good the audiobook can be that they make the movie of, probably better than the movie, possibly better than the book. But anyway, you, you can certainly find these things on audio. Uh, library read titles are another what I'd call hot books that fit in this category, and most of those are on audio as well. And in our, in our blog, The Booklist Reader, we always list the audio links, the publisher information for every, for the audiobook version of every book on library read, so you can order those easily there. And then there are these celebrity book clubs. And all I can say is life was so much easier when we only had Oprah's book club. <laughs> Um, I can guarantee, though, that you're going to find most of these books, book choices, book club choices, on audio as well. And this is an Anatomy of a Miracle from Sarah Jessica Parker's Picks for ALA, and that's just an example of what you can find. The second way I think readers choose is through series. Um, you know how readers are. If there's a series and there's a new one coming out, they are at our throats until we get the book on order and then we get the book in and put it in their hands. And frankly, we listeners are just the same. I can't tell you how I look forward to, to the next entry in my favorite series. Um, we listeners are serious about series and we librarians need to know which are popular in our library and collect them if we can. And that's not just for adult readers. Most of my slides are talking about adult readers, but it's readers of all ages. The narrator is a really important part of the appeal of series, which leads to... You into another device, so I am locking you out of this one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Bam. Well, <laughs> that's a little terrifying. <laughs> and I'm not sure what device I'm locked out of, but as long as these keep moving, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> so, narrators are really important in series, and listeners choose audiobooks by the narrator. Following a narrator that you like is really a great idea. Um, you can, if you find someone whose voice you like, you can follow that narrator across fiction and nonfiction, all kinds of genres. It's a great way to kind of explore the collection. Um, you'll, re you'll find books that you never thought you would enjoy, and, and find that you, you know, you probably do. Uh, we're going to give you a list of some great, of some of our favorite narrators, and we'll be sharing that with you. And, and these up here are some of mine, some of the books that, that I have loved. Narrators are perhaps the most important aspect of the listening experience. It's their skill, after all, that transforms even mediocre books into fabulous listens, even though the best narrator can't fix a, poor, a poorly written book. Although, um, I've given you some examples of books with single, yeah, right, single narrators. Um, but you'll find titles that have two, three, four narrators, and even a full cast that Beth is going to talk about later. I do have a word of warning for you and your patrons, though, if you're following a narrator. I don't recommend listening to book after book after book narrated by that same person, because you'll be in the same position you are if you watch movie after movie after movie with your favorite actor. You'll see the quirks, you'll know what they do, and it's not nearly as much fun. So follow a narrator, but kind of space them out. Um, award winners. That's another way that the uh, listeners choose. The best known audio award, audio awards are the Audis that are given every May, and they're top awards for the best of the year, but they're also awards within each genre and for adult and younger listeners. It's always a great list. Um, but we librarians love lists, and Booklist always publishes its editor's choice list for adult and youth audio in the January issue. 
And we also publish other ALA best lists, and they appear in a book list issue in the spring. It has to be after the, the conference, which was late this year because the conference was. But those include the Listen List for Adult Listeners, Amazing Audiobooks for Young Adults, Notable Children's Recordings for Youth up to age 14, and the Odyssey Award, which Booklist co-sponsors and which honors children's and, YA, and or YA titles. But don't listen, limit your listeners to uh, just the audio awards. You're going to find almost all of the print winners on audiobook as well. And that's a great way to experience those, those books again. National Book Award, Pulitzers, the Carnegie Medalists, and all of the genre winners. You're going to find almost all of those, I think, on audio. And lastly, listeners often like to revisit the classics from their school days, uh, or to sample those books that they always meant to read, or those that they have to read and really don't, have to, don't want to take the time to spend time with a book in hand. And audio is a great way to do this. Um, I'm not much of a rereader. There are so many books that I haven't read that I always feel the pressure to keep reading new stuff. But honestly, there is nothing like picking up your favorite book, the, the book that you've read and loved, and reading it in a new way with your ears on audio. For me, that's the ultimate comfort food. A book I love and it's read to me so I can just sit back and enjoy, absorb all that pleasure. If you haven't tried it, I heartily, heartily recommend by, um, listening for rereading books. Audio is also a great way to catch up on those titles that you always meant to read or the ones you need to read. Reading with your ears sometimes produces slightly different results, a different reading experience, and one I highly recommend. So I'm going to leave you with two last thoughts. Um, one, two ways that I think listening advisory is very much like reader's advisory. And the first is, this is a conversation. This is a back and forth with the listener, and we learn as much as the listener does about the books, especially if the listener is telling us about some narrator that we've never heard of or some book that was particularly fine on audio. Uh, we, we should encourage these conversations. Listeners love to have a chance about the, to talk about the books they love, and we benefit from the experiment. Secondly, listeners' advisory, like readers' advisory, is about possibilities. Encourage listeners to take several books. We make suggestions to them. Take several books, talk about the appeal, and in offering possibilities, we help listeners discover titles they might never have found on their own and might really enjoy. If they don't like them, they can bring them back to the library and get something else, they're free. I've always thought that we stopped reading to or aloud to our children way too early. And sharing a book out aloud offers so many opportunities for connecting beyond our own experience with a book. And sometimes, for me at least, there is no greater comfort than being read to. And having said that, it's time to introduce our reader to you. Terry Schnaubelt is a professional author, actor, <laughs> maybe an author too, who knows what she does with these audio books. <laughs> no, a professional actor and award-winning audiobook narrator who's voiced over 170 titles, ranging from romance to mystery and thrillers to a wide variety of nonfiction, and even adult romance under a pseudonym Lynn Barrington. And if you ask her later, she might uh, give you that smoky voice. <laughs> <laughs> she records from her home studio in Waukegan, and her passion for audiobooks drives her to connect with other narrators, listeners, and authors to promote the art of storytelling through audiobooks. Terry began listening to audiobooks over 20 years ago when she started oil painting so as a way to engage her mind during hours of repetitious works with books on tape from the Warren Newport Public Library in Gurney. So you could say she owes part of her success in audiobook narration to libraries. Terry, do you want to read, uh, stay there? Or no, yeah, that'd be great. Actually. Okay. Sit down. Just sit down. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, uh, I started listening to audiobooks from the, the library, um, and uh, I actually, about 10 years ago, I started acting professionally. Um, I started out doing just voiceover commercials and industrials, um, and then later started doing on camera, and then um, a couple actors I knew started doing audiobooks, and I was like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I listen to audiobooks all the time. So I started into that. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my story in a bit, but I wanted to first read a little bit um, from a recent book I did called Right Behind You by Lisa Gardner. Has anyone listened to it or heard of it? 
It was a number one New York Times bestseller in print. Mm -hmm. um, so I was fortunate enough to be chosen by Brilliance Audio to do the audiobook version. Um, and it was a lot of fun. So it's a mystery thriller, for those of you who don't know. And just to set up this scene real quick, um, uh, it's from the POV of a 13-year-old girl, uh, this particular segment. And she has been separated from her older brother, who's about 17 at this point, um, for like nine years because he allegedly killed both their parents. Allegedly is the key. Um, and allegedly now he has killed other people. Um, so this is the first time that they're actually meeting again after being separated for nine years. So again, she's 13 and he's about 17. Seconds pass, maybe a full minute, I'm not sure. Eventually, I feel the muscles soften in Luca's shoulders. When I raise my head, I expect my brother to be gone, to have vanished as dramatically as he appeared. But he's still standing there, not having moved an inch. With all the fancy streaks and paint on his face, it's hard to make out his features. I see mostly the whites of his eyes. I wonder how he learned to disguise himself this well, become such an outdoorsman. Sharla, he says. Telly, I answer. Then for a long time we say nothing at all. Luca breaks the silence first. He whines, licks my face. I realize for the first time I'm crying. It embarrasses me. I pull away from Luca long enough to scrub my cheeks. When I look up again, my brother is still there. The trails, the woods, quiet all around us. I came looking for you, I say, because someone's got to do something. I heard you got new parents, cop parents. You should have stayed with them. I didn't want you to hurt them. I didn't want them. I make myself look him in the eye. I didn't want them to have to hurt you. He doesn't say anything. Just stares at me with his disconcerting face blending into the tree trunk behind him, the rifle loose in his hands. I wonder if this is the same gun he used on his foster parents, or those people at the gas station, or the police officers. Your foster parents, I say at last. Why? He shakes his head, as if trying to deny my words. And strangers at the easy gas? Telly, what are you doing? You shouldn't be here. But I am. Go home. Or what? You'll shoot me? I draw myself up tall, proud of how brave I sound, even if I'm quivering on the inside. My brother looks at me again, and for the first time, I can finally read his expression. Grief, horror, sadness, deep, endless sadness. I can't help myself. I reach out a hand. That quickly, he fires to life, rifle pointed straight at me, level, steady. Yep. He's come a long way in the past eight years. Luca starts growling again, and only my fingers wrapped tight around his collar keep him in place. Damn it, Charlotte, where's a baseball bat when you need one? Get out, go home, I mean it, get the hell away from me. Or what, you'll shoot? You don't understand, then tell me. Get the hell away from me, no. I pull, I'll pull the trigger, so help me God, I'll do it. Then do it. You stupid, think of your arm, Sharla. Want me to break the other one? Mom, I say. Just like that, he draws up short, rifle bobbing uncertainly. What? Mom, I repeat. He doesn't say a word, but then I don't expect him to. I remember Mom, I say. I remember that night, and I know Telly. I know why you broke my arm. So she doesn't remember, but she killed her mom. And that's why he broke her arm and stopped her. Thank you. So that was a fun one to read. And um, yes, sometimes I get creeped out reading mysteries and thrillers because I end up working late at night sometimes. <laughs> and people have asked me that, like, do you ever get creeped out? Yes, I do. And um, an interesting, interesting thing, too, is um, Sometimes I'll take a book that's a mystery or a thriller, I'll accept it, 
from a publisher and uh, I'll read it and there's just like a really evil person in it, right? I mean, I'm, this is not even Stephen King stuff I'm narrating. And there's just an evil person and you're like, oh, oh, I don't even know if I want to read what this guy's doing, you know? But I got to read it first and then I got to narrate it. So I got to like live through it twice. <laughs> So yeah, it's um it's an interesting dichotomy because you hate this person, but then I want as an actor, I want to portray this person convincingly that that I'm because sometimes those serial killers or serial rapists or whatever, they enjoy what they do or they feel they have to do that. So I want to convince you or the listener that I believe that. So I got to put myself in my acting role and portray that and that's it's hard but sometimes you're like, "Ooh, this is delicious and evil. <laughs> so anyway, um, so yeah, I've been listening to audio, audiobooks for about 20 years. Um, I started acting professionally about 10 years ago. Started with voiceover, then on, on camera. Um, some actor friends introduced me to audiobooks, and I jumped right in and have never looked back because um, I love it so much. Um, and I got my start on a site called ACX.com, which is owned by Audible, which is owned by Amazon, because really everything's owned by Amazon now. Um, <laughs> but it's a place where an independent author who's independently published, you know, they can't get published by HarperCollins or whoever, um, has published a book on Kindle or whatever, and they want to now do an audiobook. So they, they can now go to ACX.com and put their project up and either have a narrator's audition for it or handpick certain people to audition or just say, you, I want you to, I want you to narrate my book. Will you narrate it? And then they'll, we'll negotiate a price and so forth. So that's how I got my start. I worked on ACX um, for about a year part-time, like nights and weekends, to sort of get going in this career, this new part of my career, part of my acting career. And after a year, I was able to transition from my day job of freelance graphic design to full-time audiobook narration and acting. Um, so uh, after about two and a half years, I'm working strictly on ACX, doing about 70 books. Um, mostly romance, uh, some mystery. Um, then I started talking to major publishers, Brilliance Publishing, Tantor Audio, um, HarperCollins, people like that. I started meeting them and they started giving me work. So uh, fortunately they like me. <laughs> um, so they keep getting, they give me work and I'm very fortunate to be busy doing several books every month. <laughs> um, I do about 50 a year. Um, and I do them all from my home studio. Brilliance Audio, I don't know if you know, is over actually in Grand Haven, Michigan. And when I first started with them, they brought me out there about once a month for several months to record a book or two in their studio. And then in addition, they'd give me some at home to do. Um, and I have, at home I have a, um, a soundproof booth that I got from Spain. Why did I get it from Spain, you ask? <laughs> because it is modular and you can like take it apart and move it because the walls are so thick that these panels would be like 350 pounds a piece. That's how thick they are to keep the soundproofing uh, aspect of it. So now that I have this booth, I don't have to stop when my neighbors are mowing the lawn or using their leaf blowers. Um, <laughs> and so it's perfectly quiet, it's wonderful. So it is up to my quality and made me able to narrate for longer and do more work, which is great. Um, so, just a little bit about the process of what it takes to make an audiobook, if you don't know. Um, if you see like a 10 hour audiobook on the shelf, that has taken a team of people about 60 to 70 hours of work to do. Um, normally the process when I work with a publisher is they'll ask me if I'm interested in doing a book. I don't often have to audition, which is surprising, um, but what I do, Quite often they just say, would you like to be submitted? Because sometimes the author has uh, final say or sign off. Um, and they'll send the author like five or 10 samples of narrators and they'll get to choose. They're like, this is my first, second, third choice. Um, and then depending on our schedules, uh, that'll work out. But sometimes, quite often they'll just say, hey, do you want to do this book? I have this book, I thought you'd be great for it. And I pretty much always say yes. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, so I end up doing a wide variety of books, which is great. I do mysteries and thrillers, I do romance, I do adult romance under my pseudonym Lynn Barrington. Um, that's the naughty stuff. And then um, I also do a lot of nonfiction, which I love because I'm kind of a dork. And I just, these books that I would never think to pick up in a library or in a bookstore, I 
I read it and I have, I just somehow am able to tap into the author's passion for what they're talking about because this is, this is their baby. They put a lot of time and you know years potentially into these. So I like to tap into that and really just dig in and become the author and I am the one sharing you, imparting my passion for this. So it ends up being a great challenge and I've read some really fascinating books, some heart-wrenching, very sad uh, tales um, like the one I did about the conflict in Syria. It was um, a, by a reporter, a journalist that was over there a couple times during the beginning of that and then after it had been going on for about a year or two. Um, Heart-wrenching stories, but you know it's it's important to get these out and have them told. Um, so okay, so uh, they get they give me the script. Like I said before, I think I mentioned I read the book all the way through, and then I go in the booth and I narrate it. The reason I read it all the way through is because invariably on page two seventy five they'll say the major character has a British accent, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that would have been good info to have on page two. <laughs> So, but I mean, luckily it's all in a PDF form, so I can do searches. Um, but I like to get a sense of the story as a whole, the arc of the story, the arc of the characters. I really dig into the characters and get to know them from beginning to end, how they change, and so forth. So it's just nice as an actor to get that perspective. So then I, I record it. Um, I anytime I make a mistake, I stop recording and I pick up and I fix it right, right there on the fly. So when I send all of my audio files off to the publisher. There, there, there's no mistakes in there. So then they take it, they have an editor that edits the files, then they hand it to a proofer who then listens to the entire book and reads along with the manuscript and things that I invariably have missed, <laughs> misspoke or mispronounced, God forbid, um, then they send me the changes, I send them one audio file with all of my pickups and they edit them back in and then they get it ready for retail. So it is quite a bit of work, um, but it's, a, it's great to have you know, other people listening to it and telling you, <laughs> maybe you should do this a little differently, or you know, this is the more acceptable pronunciation for that. Um, so I have uh, some, um, so there's a lot of work behind the scenes that, to produce an audiobook, but thankfully, um, a lot of us narrators work at home now, thanks to technology, advancement in technology, and thanks to digital downloads. Um, audiobook sales have increased, and I do have some stats from the Audio Publishers Association that audiobook sales have been growing by 10 to 18 percent a year for the past few years. In 2016, sales were over 2.1 billion dollars. So, and, and apparently, that's we're the only segment in the publishing industry that's growing right now. Everything else is flatter or uh, falling. Who's listening? Nearly half of frequent audiobook listeners are under the age of 35. Now, that kind of surprised me. Um, avid readers are also listening. So listeners read and or listen to an average of 15 books in the last year. But oftentimes it's readers that are supplementing with audiobooks when they drive or now transitioning too. So how and why are they listening? Libraries are the major access channel and important drivers of audiobook discovery. 27% of people said borrowing from a library was very important for discovering new audiobooks. And I know that obviously firsthand for myself, but um, I was surprised that it's still that high. 27%, that's really high. 29% um, of listeners in 2016 says they use their smartphone most often. Um, most are done, are list, they listen at home, 57% are in the car, 32%. 68% of listeners do housework while listening, 65% bake, 56% exercise, 36% crafting. And with the rise of, you guys know, Amazon Echo and Google Home, those um, Bluetooth speakers, now it's even more accessible, right? So it's going to be even better this year. So in 2016, 50,000 titles were produced on audio. The most popular genres are mystery, thriller, suspense, science fiction, fantasy, and romance. The top three reasons why people enjoy listening to audiobooks, and uh, Joy said it earlier. One, they can do other things while they're listening which we just talked about. Two, they are portable, people can listen wherever they are. And three, they enjoy being read to. Which brings me to my last point. So recently I listened to the audiobook, do um, you guys know Brian Cranston, Breaking Bad? Okay, uh, his audiobook, A Life in Parts, very good. He, and, he, and he mentioned something that I almost skipped by. He talks about the art of storytelling is the quintessential human art form. And I had to stop the audiobook and think about that because I just, I just realized that so much of what we do as human beings revolves around telling a story. I mean, on social media, we're telling little stories in our posts, our pictures, our videos, our memes, right? 
they're all stories. We call a friend on the phone or text them or meet for dinner or coffee. We're exchanging verbal stories about our lives, right? Little stories. What happened at work or on vacation with our kids, spouses, pets? And think about other arts, painting, drawing, poetry, plays, musicals, TV shows, movies, operas, blogs, vlogs, and so many more aspects of art. It's all around storytelling. And why? Because as, as human beings, we need to connect to each other. When we tell a hero story, we're potentially learning something new, but we're also sharing in the emotions of that story, largely due to the person telling the story, right? And if there's like compassion or empathy or a shared commiserating even, we experience a bonding with another human being that, you know, is a, nece it's a necessary part of being human beings. We need to connect other people. So, um, to me, it's deeply gratifying that I'm a part of that ancient art of verbal storytelling to a potentially large audience, but in a sense, I'm doing it in an intimate way because when I'm doing this, I'm, I'm picturing just you and I sitting together in my living room or, you know, and just talking one-on-one -on -one when, I'm, when I'm narrating. So it's as if you're just sitting there in my living room with me on my comfy couch and we're having a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and I'm telling you the story. And whether it's a story that someone has written out of their imagination or out of their true life experiences. So since I sit alone in my little four by five booth every day in a little dark booth by myself, I love to come to events like this and just share my story and listen to your stories and your stories because, I mean, that's, I just love talking about something I'm passionate about as every storyteller does. So thanks for having me. We're going to have questions for Terry, but we'll save them all until the end. <laughs> um, next is going to be Megan, and I'm going to, Megan, and I'm going to put up her slide. And hey, do you want to come up or stay there? Oh, I stay oh is it loud enough? No, better be loud enough for the microphone. We know our narrator, our actress, can, our actor can object. Yes. <laughs> Tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> two tough acts to follow. So about myself as a listener, I will admit, for the longest time, I was a print book snob. I was not into audiobooks, you know. Um, and then one day, um, the book that I wanted to read was not available, and so I checked out the audiobook, and I had a transformative experience, <laughs> and it really was as simple as that. I was lucky enough to um, check out a copy of um, Winter Girls by, uh, what is her name? Lori Hale Sanderson. Sanderson. And it was one of those um, magical combinations of well-written book with a really talented narrator that just brought the story um, to life in a vivid way that um, left me changed and open to um, to audiobooks. Since then, um, I've become more of a magpie listener. I will listen to anything, although I, like Joyce, probably have increased um, my consumption of nonfiction reading through, through audiobooks over the years. And um, when I talk about my favorite uh, narrators and some of my favorite audiobooks, um, a theme will develop that I will leave you to discover that on your own. Um, so, very quickly, um, I will give a few tips that I have learned um, over the years when I've had um, varying degrees of collection development responsibility for, um, for audiobooks, both physical and, and digital collections. And so my very simple slide is identify your priorities, by which I mean look at your collection development you know, policy and see what it says about audio. And if it doesn't say anything about audio, then write, get a collection development policy that will help you make choices about where you're going to spend your scant resources. Um, you know, unless you're very, very lucky, you're not going to have perhaps as, as much collection money to throw at audio as you would at print. And as anyone who buys audio knows, they are not similarly priced. Audiobooks are expensive. And so you can't 
always buy in the quantity and in the um, variety that you would like to. So you really need to work hard to, de to determine how you're gonna, how, how you're best going to serve your, your readers, your community, um, your patrons through audio in the best guide. You know, it's always easier when you have a foundation document to help you make those decisions um, because it can be hard to decide if you're going to get everything, if you're going to concentrate on getting, you know, bestsellers, how many copies of the bestsellers are you going to get, that type of, that type of thing. So determine, you know, work with, work with your team and determine um, what your priorities are and then ruthlessly stick with it and advocate for getting more of a slice of that collection. Um, collection pie going forward because as Renee pointed out um, audio is growing and we know um, we have the numbers to back up um, the assertion that a li the library is a key point of access for readers so it's important um, there's a there's a uh, case to be made a strong case to be made for that um, another very simple slide so if you have um, selection responsibilities, acquisition responsibilities, um, figure out who your team is and work with your vendors, especially in this age of um, increasing access to digital and downloadable titles, you know, determine what platforms your library subscribes to, you know, is there any opportunity to take advantage of bundled pricing, certain um, certain publishers will, will often, you know, give you a discount on both the physical and the and the digital copy, you know, if if that works for your collection. Um, if you have, if you, you know, work, if you don't select for both, then find your counterpart and work together to determine who's going to buy what in what format so that, you know, um, you can have the broadest collection possible. Um, figure out, you know, who's got a standing order that will help you out. Figure out if it is more cost effective for your library to order directly from, from Amazon or another supplier, or if it's more cost effective to, you know, get pre-processed, you know, um, titles, etc. It really depends on the size of your library, um, the amount of your budget, and also the, the um, amount of time your your cataloging or processing or acquisitions department can spend doing um, doing the labor of making things shelf ready if, if you're not purchasing that way. Okay, so showcasing your collections, moving to advisor. I think that all of us probably, you know, know hopefully to incorporate audio formats into all of your displays, um, digital or, or physical displays. And, you know, don't forget to, to create um, indications that, you know, you have something in a downloadable format, even if you don't have the CDs. Maybe you have it on OverDrive or One Click Digital or some other, you know, Hoopla or something. So, you know, take the time to make it as widely known as you possibly can with, with every display or, you know, book list or favorites list or social media post. Don't forget to, to throw it out there and, hey, we have this in audio because you never know. Mm -hmm. You know, you, your audio listeners, the people who like audio, they go straight to the audio, but what about all those people who may not realize that they like audio until you make it, you know, um, make it known to them that it is an available option. Um, and, you know, when you're talking with people, you know, have the conversation with them. Have you tried audio? Have you thought about audio? Um, talk it up. If, where you can, if it's possible, um, at lunch. You know, it's a very, it was a very good question. Why are the audiobooks often segregated in their own audiobook ghetto to the side? And there are a lot of reasons why that is, but, you know, if you have the ability, to interfile your collection, at least in your new materials, you know, displays. That's a great way to just put it out there um, and make it more visible than it might otherwise be. Good stuff. Um, okay. So talk with listeners. So we have conversations. Joyce mentioned this. This is always a conversation with people, one-on-one. Um, -on -one. You can. 
you know, ask them if they are listeners, um, you know, what types of books do they like? Do they follow a narrator? Um, but if they're not listeners, is there an opportunity to, to talk to them about audio and maybe turn them into listeners? Um, I think that um, one of the easiest ways that you can do this, um, if you're already do doing advisory work, then you're very aware of where to find um, the, the bestseller list, the awards list. You know, you probably know how to use novelists to look for read-alikes. Um, Renee is going to talk in yes. a couple of minutes about how you can use novelists to, to grow your vocabulary of audio appeal terms. Um, and it's very, very handy if the bestseller is on hold and it's, you know, find some, find some listen-alikes. You know, it is possible. You don't have to have listened um, extensively necessarily to be able to come up with some viable options to put into somebody's hand today. And as Joyce said, it's not necessarily about finding the perfect book for that for that listener in the moment. If it's about giving them some options that you think, based on the conversation that they're, you're having with them, that um, might work for them or may not. You know. Um, they can bring it back and get another one if, if they weren't, if you didn't make it, it's no big deal. It's, it's not personal. And you get a circulate, you search that out of it anyway. Um, I think one of the things that I have noticed recently, um, I'm a rabid, avid podcast listener, um, as I think a lot of people are. and. Um, if someone is a podcast listener, there's there's likely an audiobook that you know would appeal to them because they're already in the habit of listening to people tell them stories in their ears as they're going about their lives. So it's a natural kind of extension of that conversation to talk to them about the stories that they like to hear and maybe help them find you know a different a different way of getting those stories into their ears. Um, so, I would recommend, if you're not sure, look at Booklist. Booklist does a, a very, very, very good job of rounding up titles that will help you, you know, incorporate audio into, into your displays, um, into, into subjects. If someone likes gardening, you know, they've got many, many lists for that. Audiophile Magazine also is a great place to look, um, as is Audible for um, specialty lists as well. Okay, so now, Sure Bets and Gateway Titles. Um, I would listen to anything that Alan Cumming cared to read to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, along with that, I would add, you know, David Sedaris and Stephen Fry and Tim Curry. Are you seeing a theme developing? <laughs> 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 Men with British accents who <laughs> do a lot of accents are really are really great. Um, if you are trying to ease someone into audio for the first time, I think um, a sure bet is to find out if they are a fan of a celebrity and then find out if that celebrity has written a memoir and then narrated it and handed it to them. Hand it to them. Um, they will likely not be um, sad to have it. Um, some more, some more examples of my favorites. Um, there's just a variety of things you can give people: short stories, you can give people Shakespeare collections, you can give people, you know, stories that are narrated by multiple, um, multiple a variety of casts that have sound effects that don't, you know, that talk about serious subjects um, in a riveting tone that might get you to read a book about fascism, which I highly recommend. Madeline Albright is an amazing narrator, and I would not have thought that before I listened to it. So, <laughs> with that, read and talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> both different and exactly the same. So um, <laughs> I come at audiobooks from three different places. So I come at audiobooks from the point of view of a librarian. Um, I come at audiobooks from the point of view of a mom. And I come at audiobooks from like a human that <laughs> likes books and stories. So um, my experience varies 
in all of those different ways, but they come together to um, color the way that I share audiobooks with others. Um, so it's never too early to start listening to audiobooks is the first thing I would tell people. I don't know how many of you work with children's or children's departments, um, but my kids have been listening to audiobooks since they were in utero. Um, <laughs> so I basically, with my first kid, um, he listened to what I was listening to until he started parroting. And then I was like, oh, okay, maybe not Diviners by Libba Bray anymore for you, <laughs> little one. Um, and so that's when we transitioned to um, audiobooks for kids. And I knew that I was going to have to listen to the same things over and over and over and over again. So I wanted them to be something that I also enjoyed listening to. Um, and the library is the perfect place for children's audiobooks. Like that is A, the gateway, and B, um, so many of them are three minutes long that you do not want to pay $7 for a three minute audiobook, or at least I don't. Um, so a combination of those kind of download on demand, like Ho Hoopla is great for kids picture books um, on audio. Um, because you can download a bunch of them and you can just quickly flip between them at, at stoplights and whatever. Um, so for baby to pre-K, um, Mo Willems is like David Sedaris in that like, if he reads it, I will probably listen to it. And he reads all of his, his own stuff. And if it's a multi-cast, it's like him and his daughter, which if you're familiar with the pigeon books, um, his daughter does the voice of the duckling, which is darling. Um, and she does voices on some of his other standalones that are part of a series also. And um, they're very charming. Uh, John Seska is the bus driver. Um, his wife narrates some stuff too. I think she does Edwina. Um, so they are all fantastic and I'm happy to listen to them over and over and over again. I solved the mystery of how I don't have to read Dr. Seuss to my, my kids. Um, I don't know that we remember this really as we get to be adults, but those books are freaking long and they're ridiculous. Um, they're tongue twisters. They're, they're tongue twisters, absolutely. Like, you know, we use them for vocal warm ups yeah. because they're crazy. Um, but you can have like, John Lithgow and um, Jason Alexander and gentlemen like that who are professionally trained narr uh, speakers, auditors, narrators, whatever, um, read them to your children and then you don't have to, um, which is super great. And then you can also find some of your favorite audiobook narrators for teens or for adults or whatever, do children's stuff too. Um, Jim Dale does all of the Mr. Men and Little Miss audios and they're wonderful um, and again a lot of them are compiled like the, dot, the cat in the hat is a collection the mr. men is a collection so they're each like two or three minutes long but when you get an audio collection then you can let it run for however long it runs and you don't have to worry about switching out CDs or whatever the case may be um, and then as they transition to older kids libraries are another great resource because they have those kits where it's the book and the CD together. So you put the CD in, in the car and you hand your kid the book and then you give yourself five minutes of like, <laughs> that's, uh, you give yourself five minutes, right? And, um, and I mean, that's totally the way to sell audiobooks to parents because, and if they're listening with their kids, they're like, oh, this is kind of fun. Maybe I'd like to do this just for me too. Um, and so, you know that's that's the way to kind of to kind of go in that direction, um, and the the thing about audiobooks is just like read alouds is that you want to be or you can be reading a little bit above where they are in terms of their reading level um, because they're not having to process it the words and the information they're just having a story read to them. Um, so we're big fans of the Princess in Black again. The first three are part of a collection. I love a kid's audio collection because you can put it on. And there was a time where I was driving with my four-year-old in the car from Berwyn to Lake Zurich. Um, sometimes our commute was four hours round trip. 
And so um, I would put on an audio collection and be like, just get us home, please. Um, and so same with like Kate DiCamillo D. and the Mercy Watson series. Um, my six-year-old right now is so very into Magic Treehouse. Um, and they're read by um, the author, which is really nice too, um, Mary Pope Osborne. What else? Um, and so then you kind of transition to chapter books. And um, do, is anyone familiar with this Grimm's Fairy Tale audio collection? Yes. Okay, so this one, kids, well, older kids, because um, they're the Grimm stories. They're not the like Disney stories, they're the Grimm stories. Um, teens and adults. This is like, you know, you, um, Terry was talking about how they send authors like clips of a bunch of different narrators. So this is like your sampler of narrators. Um, I think there's 15-ish stories in there and they're all done by different, really well-known narrators. So Jim Dale, Kate Rudd, Simon Vance, um, all of them. They just all read them. Um, so you can listen to that and be like, oh, I really like that story read by Bonnie Turpin. I would like to see what else she narrates. And then that's a gateway to a whole other set of books. Um, I no longer read Neil Gaiman in print because he reads all of his own audio. And his voice telling his story is better than anything I can do in my head. Um, so I love him. The Graveyard Book is fantastic. Which brings me to my next slide. They also did the Graveyard Book as a full cast audio. So sometimes people love full cast audio, some people don't like full cast audio. But if you are listening to, used to listening to podcasts or NPR or you, know, you like radio plays or whatever it is, because radio plays have become a thing now again through podcasts. So if people like that kind of experience, full cast audio is a great choice for them. Um, and you can give them the full cast, cast audio of a book and then give them something else that was written by the same author or has one of those narrators in it and it kind of bridges that gap, right? Um, so BBC is great for a full cast audio. Uh, so they did uh, the Golden Compass, the um, His Dark Materials trilogy. They did the Graveyard Book. They do a ton of like classics, Shakespeare, whatever's. Um, so those are great. Uh, Salt to the Sea is a full cast audio. The first Lemony Snicket, The Bad Beginning, was done as a full cast audio with Tim Curry. Eh? And um, <laughs> Tim Curry reads the second one, and then Daniel Handler starts reading them, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> he can do what he wants. Um, I mean, not completely. Um, in terms of his books and his audiobooks. <laughs> um, just like Megan suggested a um, hi, I was here, now I'm gone. Uh, <laughs> Megan said something and it was really brilliant and celebrities. insightful. Celebrities. What? Celebrities! Yeah, so whew, it's right, literally there on the slide, guys. So sorry. Okay, so um, if you know that there's an actor that you really love, um, there's a good chance that if they are high profile enough, they've done an audiobook or two, even if they haven't read a, wrote a memoir. Um, and a lot of these, also like the full cast audios, are great for family listens. Um, the road trip is the other gateway to audio listening. Somebody comes in and they say, we're gonna be in a car for 26 hours. <laughs> I have a six year old, a nine year old, and a 13 year old, what do I get? Those full cast audios are great or these kind of like classics, everybody loves it, like Matilda or Anne of Green Gables or Wizard of Oz. Um, Lin-Manuel Miranda reads audiobooks, you guys. <laughs> Do it. Um, audiobooks help me to do my job. So this is now we translate, we've transitioned to the library part. Um, the Diviners, I would never have had the time in the point of my life where this book came out to read it in print. It's a, it's a good, good size book. But over the course of a few weeks, in my car, I was able to read this book. The audio is fantastic. Um, it's not on the slide because I'm not exactly saying that it's the best audio, 
But as librarians, I need you all to know that the only way I was able to read the Twilight books in order to tell parents what was really in them, because that's the question I got over and over and <laughs> over again, was like, should I really let my kid read Twilight? Um, at the time I read them, the, only the first three books out were out. So I was like, yeah, it's fine. And then she wrote the fourth one. But anyway, <laughs> the first three, I would not have been able to read those books in print because I had no motivation to do them. But I was stuck in my car, and so I would, I would listen to Twilight so that I could do my job better. Um, so that's, that's a thing. Um, another thing is, and this is a secret. You guys ready for it? You can speed audiobooks up. <gasps> I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There are some audiobooks that I kind of want to slow down because they're so good, but if you need to get through a book because you need it for your book club or you need it, you know what? We do it with print books too. We speed through them. We read the first chapter, we read the last chapter, we read the synopsis, we, we do what we have to do to recommend books. Um, but you can speed them up. A 1.25, a 1.5, then you just get crazy. I know that there is a, is a librarian who she listened to everything at two, which to me is like, I mean, she must have been a really big fan of the chipmunks when she was <laughs> um, But like, you can do that. There's not rules um, when it comes to audiobooks. And if you need it, not because you're loving listening to this book, but because you have to read it. And also, they're not always at like a conversational pace. So in per for, on purpose, they speak and they enunciate and they slow down, which is lovely if you want to take in every single moment of that. But if it's like, I have to get through this book by Friday, let's do this. Um, you can totally speed it up. That was my I'm done. Um, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, here's an A. <laughs> Renee's going to tell us about tools. Yes. I mean, we're not by ourselves. We're not alone out there in the world. Yes. Okay, hopefully this is still active. So hello all, my name is Renee Young, and I am a librarian with Novelists. I hope you're all familiar with Novelists. If you're not, um, we are a company that is dedicated to answering the question, what should I read next? Um, we have a suite of products that helps librarians answer that question, both for themselves and for their patrons. And um, we've been doing that for over 25 years. A few years back, we started um, adding audiobook information to our premier database, which is Novelist Plus. We currently have over 76, information on over 76,000 audiobooks in Novelist Plus, and I'm going to give you a little mini tour of it today and point out some of the, the content that is available to help you with listener's advisory. Um, oh, before I begin that, I will tell you that I am a lifelong um, audiobook listener. I, I was thinking about it as these ladies were talking, and I think the first audiobook I remember listening to was The Berenstein Bears and the Spooky Old Tree. And I had a little <laughs> record, like an actual record, that we used to play over and over again. And it's, it's gone full circle now because I read that to my little boys, and they love it. Um, one of my most memorable audiobook listening experiences was not long after I started at Novelist, and the big book at the time was The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And I, of course, got it on audio. And I hadn't really paid that much attention to how people were talking about this book because I wasn't that familiar with um, Scandinavian crime fiction. And so all I heard was, it's like a locked room mystery, but on an island. And you know, it's a mystery. So I was like, soul, I'm listening to it. And so I listened to it, and it started getting a little dark. And so I was completely hooked by the time, like there's that horrible graphic violent scene with Elizabeth and her her guardian and um, so I had like one earbud in and like one earbud out and I was sort of like going in and out with the earbud that was in because I can't listen to it but I didn't want to lose the theme of like the plot so it's like oh my gosh how long is this going to take and I couldn't <laughs> what I was listening to on was my um, iPod and I couldn't speed it up 
So <laughs> I was desecrating the narration, but I also wasn't listening to it all because it was just it was too graphic. You can't get away from it. So sometimes it's good. Um, sometimes it's good narration that you can't get away from. Sometimes if it's I don't I didn't listen to um, Twilight on audio, but oh my gosh, like bad. Oh, sorry, I'm judging. <laughs> I'm judging. Okay, but. Books that you don't care for are worse on audio because it's in your head. You just, you, yeah, just don't even do it. All right, so back to novels. So this is um, Novelist Plus, and this is the the primary database in our suite of products. This is the only one that has audio books because it also contains our fiction and nonfiction print collection. So we added audio books to this. Um, this is the most complete product that we have, so we like people to use this. Um, I'm going to give you a little tour of this, um, but before I begin, I'm, one thing that I will also be talking about, um, as I think Megan mentioned, are our appeal terms. And appeal terms are really a market differentiator for novelists. We, uh, we did not invent them. People like Joyce Serex and Neil Wyatt have been talking about them for years and years. Appeal factors are basically terms that librarians and their patrons use to describe how a book makes them feel and what they like about the books. So they are, they're just words that, that kind of come up whenever you're talking about books. Like it's, it's suspenseful, it's romantic, it's feel good, it's heartwarming, it's moody, it's menacing, terms like that. So it's not, so if you're talking to someone, you're doing a reader's advisory interaction with someone, and you're asking them, well, what was the last book you read and you loved? They're not going to say, well, I love that book about feet. They're going to say, well, I read this crazy book about corpses, and it just, it was, it was captivating, and it was just, it was so immersive, like you can't get away from it. So they're the terms that you as librarians should be listening for and also introducing to your, your patrons so that you can identify what captivated them about a certain title. And then you can go on Novelist and search for that term. It's pretty cool. Um, when we added audiobooks to Novelist Plus about four years ago, we expanded our appeal language to include audio characteristics. So this is a vocabulary specifically for audiobooks. And we describe the production um, choices that the publishers make, like whether a book is read by the author or if it's read by a full cast, if it has multiple narrators, if it has sound effects. And we also have characteristics, I have my cheat sheet here, um, thing, terms that describe the voice of the narrator and their performance. So if they use, if they have a gravelly voice, if they, um, if they're very unhurried, um, let's see, a term that Joyce mentioned, um, she didn't mention the term, but she said that she really likes it when narrators read their own memoirs. Um, I'm sorry, authors read their own memoirs. We, um, we have a term for that. It's called sincere. And the definition goes something along the lines of heartfelt, although maybe not as polished as professional narrators, these authors choose to read their own works and it imbues them with lots of heartfelt emotions, something like that. And it's true. Um, someone reading their own work can bring depths of emotion to it that you wouldn't you may not get with a professional narrator, but you may really want that, that level of polish that someone like Terry can bring to a memoir. Um, something that we've just added, I'm very excited to talk about this. Um, we've been working on creating a, a vocabulary of themes that was added to Novelists about two weeks ago. And themes, um, or you can call them tropes, they are, um, they are sort of like common plot devices or story um, story arcs that you'll find fr frequently within the same genre. So if you're a romance reader, think Hidden Baby or um, Sudden Baby or Marriage of Convenience. So there are these, these plot um, contrivances that you see repeated over and over again, but in new ways. And so, but they're things that people really like, and so that's why they keep reading those genres. And I will get to the product right now. Um, so this is the homepage. Um, this gold bar that you see up here at the top, um, 
internally in Novelist, we call this the gold bar. And we like to point this out because it is a static feature, a nav navigation feature on every page in Novelist Plus. So if you're ever sort of like lost in the, the depths of Novelist Plus, you can always go up, look up the top, and you can click on home and it'll take you back home. However, if you go to browse by, you can scroll down and click on that link and that will take you to our audiobooks landing page. Right now, I'm just teasing you with that because there's another way to get to that on the home page. So I'm going to scoot over here and click on help. So this is not the equivalent of a fire alarm for novelists, okay? Please do not only click on this in case of an emergency. This is for you for anything. This has a wealth of information that I really hope you all, if you haven't checked it out, I think I strongly recommend that you look at it. It may be a little hard to read on this screen, but when you're on your computer at your desk, it's perfectly legible. Um, all right, so I'm going to scroll over here to this index on the left, and I'm going to go under How Do I, and then you click on Find Books Using Appeal or Genres. And you click on that, and this takes you to a larger area, and this contains some great lists. We have download links for our secret language of books, which is the Guide to Appeal, the Novelist Guide to Appeal, which we um, will be happy to send you a print copy if you just let us know. Further down this page, we also have a download link to our Guide to Genres, which is a PDF version. You can just print that out. We're constantly updating it, so we're only um, providing that as a download. We also have help pages for the appeal terms, and this will open a new tab. And you'll see here, there's the, the breakout of our different appeal categories. So we have character, storyline, pace, etc., etc., and then audio characteristics. And so if you click on that, you'll see the full list of all of our audio characteristics with the, the scope note or the definition, and then the reading levels that we apply it to. Um, I'm going to go back to help so I can show you some more cool stuff. If you go back to that same link, and then you just scroll a little further down, you can find the same information um, or the same resources, but for our genre terms. So we have the link to the, the downloadable genre guide and a link to a list of our genre terms. If you go back to the index on the left side of the page and scroll down, oops, I went too far, to story elements, you can also get to our appeal genre terms and our new themes. And this has the breakouts, as I mentioned, they're typically within genres. Some themes um, work with different genres and then they'll be listed under each genre heading. I'm talking a lot, so I will speed things up a bit. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. We'll see some of those themes on the book titles um, as I do some searches. But the last thing I want to show you in help is if you go here under searching and search using field codes. This is pretty spectacular. If you guys are um, in novelists a lot, you can go to bookmark our full list of field codes. And these are two letter codes that you can use with Boolean operators and, or, and not. And it's basically just power searching. So we had, I was in a meeting yesterday where we had a customer feedback and the person said, I don't want to see any titles that are part of a series um, on my search results. How do I make that happen? And currently we don't have a way, we don't have a specific limiter to make that happen, but you can make it happen with the field code. So say you wanted a mystery story. You can do, and I'm just going to do it one search with field codes. You could do GX mysteries. GX is our genre exact field code. And then you can do your Boolean operator and. Um, and just because this is about audiobooks, we're going to do audiobook specific. Oops. So ND is the format, audiobook. And then um, I forget if I said they wanted. We actually had two feedbacks. One said, I only want to see um, series titles. And the other one said, I don't want to see series titles. So you, S A is series, N is no. Um, so this will give us a fudge. 
<laughs> that will give us the timeout screen. Our favorites. So this will give us a result list of audiobook mysteries, and none of them will be series titles. If you wanted to see audiobook mysteries that are part of a series, you can just change this N to Y, and it will um, give you titles that are part of a series. All right. Oh no, Joyce is pulling out the post-it notes. <laughs> That's not good. All right. Okay. So I'm going to speed things up. On the left-hand side of the homepage, there are links to our recommended reads lists. And then if you scroll down here, there's a link to the audiobook landing page where you can browse audiobooks. This is our page for audiobook recommendations. On the right hand, there's the list of all of our recommended reads lists for audiobooks. We have a carousel of audiophile award-winning titles right here. These have all won the audiophile earphones award-winning earphones award, so they're all pretty much go-to, knock out of the park audiobooks. Like if you want to just recommend a title, this is where you can come. We also have a carousel of new and forthcoming titles. These have been published within the last two to three months and up to one month pre-pub. We also have a carousel, the bottom carousel is thematic, so this changes every couple of weeks to a month. Right now we have, um, obviously we're highlighting Audi's finalists. And if you click on the See More link, you'll see even more of the finalist titles. So if you're going to do a search for an audiobook in Novelist, you can get at it through a couple different ways. You can do a keyword search, you can do a title search, or if you um, are speaking to someone and you, they really don't know what kind of audiobook they want, ask them what the last print book they liked was. And you can search for that, and we'll show you if there's an audiobook for it. Like, a really amazing title is, um, that's one of my personal favorites, is The Dinner by Herman Koch. So if you just do a keyword search, um, you'll see there's tabs right here. So it defaults to the books tab, but if the audiobooks tab comes up, that means there are audiobooks. If for some reason, oh, okay. I was going to say there's more limiters, but because we did such a specific search, they don't come up. So you can get at the audiobook two different ways. You could click on the audiobooks tab, or you can click on the books tab, and then there will be an audiobooks tab within the title detail record. But let's just go straight to the audiobook um, tab. And um, this is an audiobook detail record. You'll see that you, we have the audiobook information here in the site, what we call the citation area. We also include this audiobook samples. Um, an audiobook review is a sound review from Audiophile Magazine where they read part of the, the review and then they include a, a sound sample of the title. We include format information. Um, right here you have the different um, appeal terms and audio characteristics. And on the right, this is pretty special, we have listen-alikes. So these are titles that have been recommended listen-alikes to the title that you're on. So, if they wanted the dinner and you didn't have it, you could still go to this page and find other titles that we recommend as a listen like for this title. And I am out of time. Um, I could talk about this a lot longer. I brought business cards. I'm happy to talk with anyone after this program. Um, and if not, if you don't have time, just email me and we can always set trainings for you and your staff or whatever you want. We're always happy to talk to people about novelists and listeners advisory. Sorry, I ran over. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Let me get back to the slides here. Okay. I guess we don't need that one yet. We're not finished. Now it's time for questions. And um, uh, we'll start. We've got, we've got some questions kind of cached here. But questions from you. What do you really, what have we not told you? What are your favorite books that we haven't talked about? Or audio books or narrators or... Ask us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
you talked about reading more, a couple of you talked about reading more nonfiction in audio than you do the fiction. So how do you talk to patrons about that? Because I find people are usually like, are, are often in kind of a lane, like they do fiction or nonfiction. So is there like some language that you use or some way you convince people to branch out when, they're, when you're talking about audio? And the question is, in case it doesn't get picked up, is that we all talked about how we read more nonfiction, but how do we share that with patrons who maybe think, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna listen to nonfiction. So what are, what are techniques to do that? Um, I, one of the things that I like to tell them is um, because of, it depends on the way that they listen, of course, but unlike a book where often, not often, but you can sit down and just plow through the whole thing if you really love it, usually with audio there's going to be chunks of time that you listen to it, and that makes nonfiction very digestible. So if you're trying to learn something or you're trying to um, just kind of get a feel for something or you have to listen to something that was assigned to you for work or whatever the case may be, I mean you have the chapters but I found that like the drive to work I will get a small chunk of whatever the audio is and then I kind of digest it throughout the day and then I get another small chunk on the way home and I process it more I think. Um, that way because I'm kind of listening and thinking and then there's a time where it's like well I'm at work now I can't be like oh I have to get to the end of the chapter or just one more or whatever so um, that's part of the appeal for nonfiction to me on audio. I would add to that if um, the narration is t is very well done mm -hmm. um, that it, you can talk about how you can talk about the quality of the narration being um, it added inducement to maybe topic. reading a, a non reading nonfiction on a topic that you wouldn't ordinarily or otherwise be interested in at all because um, you know uh, poorly narrated nonfiction is as unappealing as poorly written nonfiction <laughs> but uh, sometimes the narration can make a huge difference in whether or not um, the subject will hold interest. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, we've, we've all kind of said it in different ways. Like, I could listen to George Quiddell read a phone book. So if you just find the narrator that, <laughs> if you identify the type of narrator that would catch the person's, the patron's attention, I think that would go a long way to getting them interested in that subject. And I would add that I think nonfiction has changed a lot in the past 20 years. And it's much more accessible and readable, and it, it's more storytelling. And I think that that transfers so well to audio, and that's one of the reasons I think audio works so well. It's not just dry and bored. Other questions? Uh-huh. Um, a question about the Playaway company. Do you know, it seems like they're, that's the only um, company that does Playaways. Am I right about that? Uh, the question is whether whether the Playaway com yeah. company is the only one that does those individual audiobooks on a an actual uh, player, MP3 player, with the head and then you attach headphones. Um, I confess I'm not sure. I, to my knowledge, they are yeah. the only ones. They yeah. probably invented it, so they haven't. Right. It's kind of, yeah, it's almost certainly yeah. right. Yeah. Right. And I, I think maybe with more people with iPhones and iPods yeah. that they download to that it's not as... It's not, yeah. It's but, not. but still, for, for a lot of people it's the they thing. Like it. Yeah. I, I, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, so it seems like Downpour is the kind of the mainstream for digital downloads for libraries, but I noticed some libraries use other systems. Do, do you guys as libraries have like a sort of a tech support or tech support class or, or like a certain day of the week or something that you do tech support because I wonder if that's one of the barriers for some people. Oh, wow, you're all laughing. Is that like a big barrier for people to, to download audiobooks because they don't, they're scared of even venturing there? Yeah. Yes. No, I, I think people are pretty good about downloading. I'm not too scared. No. Yeah. They are very willing to come to the library and sit in front of you at a desk for five, 10, 15 hours and have you go through um, how to. Again do. and again and again. I mean. This is the tech support group. It's, right? it's pretty much it. And, and generally speaking, 
at least at every library I've ever worked at, in terms of OverDrive and Hoopla and all of those digital downloads, tech support is the librarian sitting at the reference desk. Um, it's not like we bring in outside. And, right, right. Mm -hmm. so um, it's always more helpful if they're there in front of you and they've brought their device with them and you can kind of, and it's certainly easier than it was when they were first launched. Sure. Um, but yeah, and it, yeah, so if we're open, we're, we're helping people download stuff. <laughs> but, but I think your comment is right too, that a lot of people are becoming a lot more savvy. I mean, once you've done it once and figured out a system, it doesn't always transfer directly, but you can, you, you can often figure it out. And every year it gets a little bit easier and a right. little bit user, more user friendly, yeah. I think. Yeah, we used to have to deal with like, the format. Is it WMA? Is it MP3? People had to download to a computer and then transfer it to a device. And now right. you, most people have smartphones, so you can just download it straight to your, an app on your phone. And that really lessens the friction. Okay. And it's kind of terrifying, you know, that it's, right. all of a sudden it's just there. You, I, find it, I find it amazing. Yeah. <laughs> For those who don't have the phone, so we're maybe, you know, seniors or whatever, but a lot of seniors do it, but um, they can always go to the CD or the play mm -hmm. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yes. Or kids, too, because a lot of yeah. kids don't. I mean, more and more kids have a phone, but a yeah. lot of kids don't. Um, right. Right, they don't have it. Because it's a computer. Yeah. Anything else? Other questions? Uh-huh. Um, is there any sort of site, um, maybe Novelist does this and I just haven't found it, where, um, like Fantastic Fiction, where you could look up narrators and see, like, this is everything this person has ever done. This is everything this person has ever done. Audible. Audible's Audible audio audio does. Audible audio audio audio. does that fairly well. You can okay. also do it in Novelist, where you can just do a narrator search. If you go just in that main search bar, there's a little drop down arrow you can search specifically for a narrator and then that it's not guaranteed to be an exhaustive list of everything that someone's done. We certainly don't have all of hundred and seventy <laughs> of Terry's audiobooks in there, but it's a good start. Yeah. The question was whether whether there's a source where you can find all everything a narrator's done. And on booklist you can look up the things that we've reviewed on booklist too by narrator. The problem is even on audible.com it's not everything. Mm. I don't think there is an exhaustive source of everything. More and more narrators, if you know that there's one narrator that your patron really loves, have their own websites, mm -hmm. and that's where you're going to find, I feel like, the most. Do you have everything listed? No, it's hard to keep it current yeah. since I do yeah. like three to four books a month. Right. Um, but on Audible, my most, almost every narrator I know of, everything is on Audible. Yeah. So yeah. search on Audible, you'll find us. And then hurt in your insides just a little bit, but then get over it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> Most of us have Audible accounts, too. Yeah. If it helps, I give away free download copies to all of my books in exchange for honest reviews. Just hit me up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of narrators what? Um, yeah. do. What? You can use Audible without having an account. Oh, oh absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely yeah. you can. Yeah. 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 Um, other questions? If not, I have a question that we often get when we talk about audiobooks, and that is, do I have to listen in order to help other listeners find books? I and mean, that seems to be a, a perennial question. I, I don't have time to listen, or I mean, it's not my thing. And it's true, listening is not everyone's thing. But uh, opinions here. Well, I don't think you have to do anything that you don't want to do. <laughs> um, I feel like if you are a person who is regularly recommending audio, even if it's not your jam, like every once in a while, if there's a book that you're really excited about reading, just listen to that on audio so that it keeps it in your brain and it, it reminds you that it's a thing that's there. Um, but and I feel like if you find the right one, you know, I have that thought too. Like, there's there's an audio book out there for everyone. Where, as one of you said, it's, it's a transformative experience. But sometimes people are just a little bit harder to convince than others about that. Every audio book is listener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. Um, if you do listen regularly, it'll make those interactions e easier. Um, I think, but you don't necessarily have to. There are a lot of great tools out there that will help you. 
I feel it's kind of like when, when we started talking about Reader's Advisory and you said, just read a romance, read a historical novel. So you have a sense of, you know, you can say, no, I haven't heard that one, but I know what you're talking about. It gives you that, that companionship. So, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's an assignment. Listen to an audio book, and at least you can say, I've listened, but tell me about what you like. And then it puts it in there. Uh -huh. I have a little funny story for you, not about audio book, but <laughs> the other day, it was this, this lady, she was pretty ancient, and she said, I like romance books. Can you recommend, I like, well, I like Daniel Steele, which I know, and, and <laughs> can you recommend something by, like her? And I use novelist, and I came up with Debbie McCumber, who had <laughs> a million books out there, and I'm so grateful to novelists <laughs> and <laughs> others, Meg yeah. Inchi and... Yeah. Thank you. So I use novelists for read-alikes quite often. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I, I think it takes us, um, the, the problem with listen-alikes is that there's that extra thing, like how do you factor in the narrator's voice? Mm -hmm. And that's something I think we need to be, it's not a straight across thing. It's something we need to be aware of. And we do factor that in, um, a little plug, we do factor that <laughs> into our listen-alikes and novelists. We use the appeal of vocabulary, um, the appeal, the, sorry, the audio characteristics to create those those listen-alikes recommendations. I know I had a coworker who, I'm like, Megan, didn't like British authors at all. <laughs> <laughs> and wow, I could <laughs> relate to that. <laughs> uh, but um, is there an easy way to like, distinguish nationality? That's a, um, that's a perennial question. It comes up a lot. Um, in novelists, you can um, you can do the Boolean searching and exclude um, character accents, but um, at this point we don't have an exhaustive list of this narrator does these accents. It, because it's so based on the story, as Terry was saying, if, if a character in the story has a British accent or any sort of accent, that's what the narrator should be portraying. And so it, it's, it's just, um, we have not figured out how to address that fully at this yeah, the question was whether there's a source that tells you what accent a person has so you can not have British accents or not have something else. And, and I think I agree with Renee that, that it depends on the book. I mean, well, couldn't you do like a keyword um, language and then have British different from standard American? As the prevailing, like overall, like the narrative, not just character accents, but just as the prevailing, prevailing narrative. Something language. that we would like to do um, in the future, in a future iteration of novelists, is to do narrator pages. Something along the lines of what Audiophile does. Mm -hmm. So Audiophile is a good resource for that because they they um, include the different accents that the narrator is really adept at. Um, but when you're trying to eliminate something, when you're sort of searching for a negative, that that creates a lot more difficulty. Yeah, and you'll find in the book list reviews too that we we say what the accent is, or try to. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to yeah. say. Uh, searching the content of reviews is a very good way to mm -hmm. right. get at that kind of thing. You can do a keyword search on book list online yeah. audio for British accent. Right, or and can you'll we do get that? a whole bunch of books that have narrators using a British accent, and you would know not to recommend it. <laughs> so you can kind of, if, yeah. if you use keyword searching of uh, review text, you can get at a lot of things like that. Not absolutely everything, but you can certainly get a chunk to direct you to More questions? Other things we can tell you? All of our favorites. We, we will be posting um, a list of some of our favorites and some tips for listeners advisory and the video is going to be up as I said earlier so you'll be able to, to revisit this event. And up here before, what, on, the, on each of the chairs is a bookless magazine with a special offer in it that used to be up here and isn't now but there's a special subscription offer in, the, in that bookless magazine if you want to take advantage of it. Um, I'm hoping all your libraries get it, but if you want to do a personal copy or if you know someone who would like it, please share that with them. Oh. I will say also, um, I'm sorry, well, I'm not sorry. I, I love novels, so I love talking about it, but you can do searching in reviews. Um, it's just, so you could, as Bill said, you could exclude, like you could search for reviews that say British or Australian 
um, and just knock those out using the Boolean operator or not. It just, it gets complicated. And honestly, who doesn't love a good British owl? <laughs> right. <laughs> I think therapy may be the answer there. <laughs> Did you have a question? No, I was going to say, actually, no, who doesn't like uh -huh. the British accent, and I know this from personal experience, English like language learners uh, have oh. trouble because she was oh. Polish, and she says, I have trouble understanding the British accents because I wasn't speaking English in America. Isn't that interesting? Because so she said it was a little more yeah. difficult for her. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Because I think usually Europeans right. learn British accents. Mm -hmm. But she learned yeah. it here. Yeah, she learned so it here. She, and so this is, yeah. so but that's it's very interesting that, that it's harder for non speakers to, to learn mm -hmm. with British or, accents or to listen to, to, to listen to so. it. That's Along that line, I have um, a woman who comes in every weekend and she has a couple of romance lover, uh, authors that she really loves and so she'll ask us to help her find them and what she does is she'll read it and then she'll ask for the audio because she's working on her listen, she's a, she's a right. Pol Polish speaker yeah. also, yeah. so she already knows the plot so when she listens to the audio, she, she knows what's going on, but it's helping her to improve her English um, in a like less threatening way. So um, audiobooks can work magic in that way too. Right, and I think audiobooks for students can work magic that way. It's just that, that we have to remind them that coming in the night before for describing the letter, <laughs> it's not going to read any faster on audio than the book. And but you speed it up. Play to three. <laughs> <to> three. <laughs> Unless you like Alan months. and the Chipmunks performing <laughs> the Scarlet Letter, yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming, all of you, and please, you know, be in touch with us at Booklist. Be in touch with with any of us uh, with your audio questions or things you things you'd like to see us doing with at Booklist. I'd really like to hear that. From you. So, thank you for coming and safe travels back. Thanks. Thank